So this past week, uh, Richard, you preached the second last uh, sermon of our God's Household series, uh, a journey through the book of First Timothy, and you touched on for verses 3 to 10 of chapter 6, uh, which are largely around money. Welcome to The Scratch Pad, where each week we compare sermon notes, yours and the preacher's. What we've been tracking along in this series has been, you know, the theme of godliness, uh, false teaching that was happening there. Um, yeah, just first of all, how are you doing? How did you find the sermon? And I want to jump back into those themes. Um, yeah. I'm doing well. I'm looking forward to finishing the series on Sunday. Not as in like I'm, I'm looking forward to it being done, but just the final part, the yeah. fight, the good fight of the faith. I've been looking forward to that one for a long time. <laughs> I feel like they've all been so so tough and challenging texts, including this past Sunday. This one coming up should be hopefully an encouragement. So, yeah, yeah I think whenever we're dealing with subjects of money, it's just always challenging, you know. So it's challenging to hear, challenging to read. I mean, like I even said in the sermon, it people don't even didn't even need me to unpack a lot of what was there it's so clear you know especially the warnings about yes. the desire to be rich like we don't really need it to be unpacked it just it sits with its own heaviness so i think that the scripture is is challenging uh, to hear and yeah it's challenging to you know to preach on i mean i realize i'm pushing into difficult areas but hey man it's my life too mm. you know we are uh you know in the process of uh, moving house and all those kinds of things associated with that so this was i was thinking through this for my own life and so um i think this is one area where we all kind of we can agree that we struggle we struggle in the same way am i right yeah you know? that's true it was certainly challenging. Uh, I mean, just the, the aspect of contentment, which we'll get into. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I just want to dial back to just this connection that we see between false teaching, godliness, money. Yeah, because it's quite an abrupt change, eh? Hey? Yeah. You know, if you're kind of reading through the passage, it's, it's back to that that particular theme of mm. false teaching. It really was a problem yeah. in the church then and in the church now. And then goes back to his favorite subject of, of godliness, which we'll track back to, you know, in our discussion today. Comes up, I think, four times in chapter six. So this yeah. idea of godliness is there and then just poof, ends up sort of in the subject of money. And I think the connection there, it's quite interesting. I didn't have time to go into this on Sunday, but I find it interesting was, you know, at the time in, you know, in Ephesus, there was no such thing as universities or schools like we know them today. Mm. Um, so what existed were these itinerant lecturers. So these guys who had knowledge on a subject would travel around, they'd kind of set up a stand in the marketplace on a particular subject. I don't know, science or whatever. And, um, and then just, generate a crowd and start sort of teaching people. If they were really good, then they would start to, you know, um, rent a bigger venue and then they would start to charge more money. And so there were these traveling sorts of teachers who ended up, you know, they, they made their living. They made a profit through teaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time now, you've got the early church that's exploding and there's a lack of of teachers because the church is exploding faster than people are being trained to teach. Mm. And so into that vacuum comes this kind of cultural circumstance of itinerant teachers who now realize, hey, there's some bucks to be made. There's a new <laughs> academic field new opening market, up. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there's a new market. Exactly. Yeah. And so guys... You know, and maybe not all of them were bad, but they were exploiting this particular mm -hmm. cultural phenomenon of being able to make money. And so guys may be very gifted speakers, but not trained, teaching false stuff, but things that would have just made them appealing mm -hmm. were, you know, starting to make a lot of money, you sure. know, off, off religion and off teaching. So I think that's probably as good a case as you can, you can make for, for what, what led for the sudden change from false teaching into mm -hmm. materialism and greed yeah. is these false teachers who presumed godliness was a means of gain, yeah. right? They could profit off of yeah. religion by, by their teaching and who duped congregations into yeah. believing that they too could profit off religion because that's just very appealing. So it yeah. made them popular. More people wanted to hear that, which is largely, am I right, the prosperity gospel today. That's exactly I mean, it's, it. It's, it's yeah. so different. Right? That, that's descriptive of our current context. You know, yeah. a lot of people have gone into uh, pastoral ministry to, to make money. It's a market. 
um, people are perceived to be gullible. They believe anything. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's sad. It's sad to And they'll see. especially believe stuff which says, hey, man, you can be rich. You can be, yeah. Without working hard or yeah. without like, paying attention to your finances, but by just believing in Jesus. So sure. I, I think what we see today, I mean, often when you turn on the TV, maybe not, they're not all bad, but often when you turn on the TV and what we know about just, you know, mm. some of the churches. So, so yeah, uh, definitely relevant to us today yeah. is these false teachers and their teaching, which connected religion with a means of material gain. Sure. And, and I think it's important to bring it back into that context of Paul is addressing an issue that is rife at the time, right? Mm -hmm. he's, he's dealing with that issue, but he's going to point people back to godliness. Yes. You know, uh, again, you touched on this the very first week of this series. Uh, you spoke about godliness. Um, yeah, let's talk about that. So it comes up so much in this book, and it's mm. it's this really sort of intriguing word. But as I mentioned, it comes up you know four times um, in chapter six. So yeah. we've got to kind of you know I didn't have time to really go into it in, into sure. the sermon again. Uh, but for example, oh, the way it's written yet, so the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, and that's kind of a familiar phrase for mm. Paul is a teaching uh, that produces godliness. Mm. Whereas on the other side, you've got these false teachers that don't produce godliness, but produce envy, dissension, yes. slander, evil suspicions, constant sure. friction, which we discussed on a scratch pad. Mm. When was that one's why? It was, it was your sermon, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, it was your, the sermon that you did. So we yeah. three or so, yeah. we actually we actually looked at this little passage yes, yeah. about these controversies yes, and quarreling about yes. words, but the teaching produces all this nonsense, oh, exactly. friction, it's division. It's not producing godliness. Yeah. Yes, whereas sure. correct teaching, so going back to the false teachers, their teaching produces not just material pursuit and the desire to be rich, mm. which plunges people to destruction, but also produces all this kinds of evil, whereas... Paul is really talking about the teaching that produces uh, godliness. Sure. Um, he'll say it again in Titus 1 verse 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. Mm -hmm. In 2 Timothy, so we're looking at the pastoral epistles here, it's a major yes. theme. Yeah. 2 Timothy, as he writes to Timothy again, he says there are these people, again, these false teachers or these false converts yes. who have the appearance of godliness, godliness yeah. but denying its power. Sure. Avoid such people. Mm -hmm. you know, so again, it's kind of just this idea that your relationship with Jesus Christ produces a way of living mm -hmm. that is in accordance with the message of Jesus, the life of Jesus, i.e. godliness. Sure. So godliness is an outward behavior that is in accord with the message of Jesus, uh, but in its source is the person of Jesus. Yes. So that's what makes it tricky. It's not just behavior management because mm. its source is Jesus. Like yeah. First Timothy 3, that first sermon I did, yeah. the mystery or the secret of godliness, yes. he, he exactly, that whole thing. Yeah. So the source of it is relationship with Jesus, yeah. but it does result in behavior yes. that is in accord with the gospel, yeah. which is against, as he goes into here, materialism mm -hmm. is against you know all these dissensions sure. and controversies and produces the household codes, Yes, yeah. produces a way of living in the home, in yes. the church, as citizens of the country. Sure. Etc. So I think that godliness is just this really broad term. Mm. The source is the person of Jesus, relationship with Jesus, yeah. and it results in behavior that is in accord with yeah. everything to do with Jesus. Sure. And I think that's a good word because it's not just behavior that is coming out of nowhere, but it's attached to the person of Jesus Christ. That's right. um, and I think the other, the other word that came through uh, was contentment. Mm. You know, um, and you, you did... Um, almost juxtapose greed and contentment. Um, and you did state godliness is attached to the person of Jesus Christ. He was manifested in the person of Jesus Christ. Um, and you spoke, and I, I put there on my notes, the cure for greed is contentment. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, let, let's talk about contentment. Um, because that was, that was my major takeaway, you know, around this. Yeah, it's contentment. I mean, yeah. like I said in the sermon, isn't it? Doesn't it just sound like the most attractive, I don't know, virtue or pursuit to sure. just 
to just be content. Yeah. And I think the 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 sure. root of the word there is sufficiency. It's kind of there's just this sufficiency about life. Um, so maybe let's helpful. Let's look at a couple of cross references. I think. Again, I would love to have done it in the sermon to really highlight what this word contentment means. And I don't think we're going to have any translation wars today, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Maybe we will. Let, um, let, let me, let maybe me I want to, to not have it because I'm ahead. I'm leading 3-1. So I want Are to you 3-1? I thought it was 2-1. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, let's have a I'll look at Philippians 4. Philippians 4, yeah. verse 11 to 13, and just for, for listeners. So, yeah. so the word contentment, uh, the Greek word autarkis. So it comes up uh, sort of two times uh, in in that form, yeah. and then one other time sort of as a as a kind of adjective, yeah. adjectival form. Okay, so you go Philippians four. Yeah, and I'll go. I'll get ready. Second Corinthians. Yeah, nine eight. All right, uh, reading Philippians four 11, verses eleven through to thirteen. It says, "I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it." I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things, or I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And it's a classic contentment. If you're going to preach yeah. on contentment, you would, you would go to that verse, yeah. uh, where there's this uh, Paul's sense of peace, his sense of sufficiency, i.e. contentment, mm. isn't rooted in material circumstances. Sure. It's, and it's not just because he had so much, he mm. can be content. And that, I think that's where we all are. If we had yeah, if only, enough, yeah. and he speaks about like, yeah, yeah I had, I abounded, yeah. you know, in, in verse 12 there, like sure. abound, I had much. Mm. You know, we, I think we think that, it's when we abound, when yeah. we have enough savings, we'll enough yeah. money, and all of our, you know, insurance mm. policies, etc., that we can relax and be and feel sufficient. He's like, no, no, no. It's it's actually independent yeah. of whether I have much or well, I have little. Yeah. yeah. So I think that that is that's that same. He's using that same word here for mm. content, so a sense of sufficiency. Second Corinthians nine. Oh, maybe what's interesting about that as well is is the verse thirteen. Is a bumper Christian bumper sticker verse. Yes, I can do all things in Christ. Christ strength strength is me, yeah. You know, I can become president of the world, or you know, like I you're doing fly. a rally cry at the Euro 2020. You know, we can be doing because we can do all things in Christ. We use that as like we can yeah. do anything, but actually, it's attached to the Content. secret of contentment. Yes. I've learned the secret mm. of contentment, sure. and that sounds impossible, mm. but hey. Christ strengthens us for contentment. Sure. So it's interesting. Reading that verse in, 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 in its context, it's so helpful. Yeah, because contentment so is great gain. Yeah. Uh, and again, like I said on Sunday, it's a bit of a, like, you know, and, you know understatement, great gain, mega gain. It's, yes. it's just amazing. Like, how do we sure. actually reach a life of contentment? And, and Paul's going, yeah, like, it sounds crazy, but mm. I can do all things for him. He strengthens me. Sure. Like, God can actually do this. So mm. when, I've, when I have little... Actually, I'll fight to be content. Actually, yeah. God can make me content. It yeah. sounds impossible, but I can do all things through Christ strengthens me. So, sure. 2 Corinthians 9, um, verse 8, is in the context. Actually, what's interesting about this is the context is generosity, of giver. So, verse 6, the little title, ESV, is the cheerful giver. So, most listeners will be recognized this verse. Mm. The point is this, ever so sparingly will reap sparingly, ever so bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one must give as he decided in his heart, not reluctantly uh, or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, right? So yeah. people are very aware of that. This is a generosity verse, which is similar to what Paul is going to say later in verse 17 and 19 to the rich. You'd be um, rich in good works mm. to be generous. And then verse 8, so it's that context. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things mm. at all times, you may abound mm. in every good work. So there's that word all sufficiency. So that's the, the same word for mm. um, contentment there. Uh, so you may abound in good work. So there's contentment, but it's sure. again kind of pushing to the instruction of generosity. Mm. And maybe we'll get to this later, but it's this idea of just being content with what you have. Mm. And if there's abundance, to give that away. To give that away, yeah. So it's kind of the idea of living with simplicity, yeah. living with just what we need is what we have, uh, and then giving the abundance away. 
And what's interesting as well is verse 9. It goes on to motivate that by saying, as it is written, mm. he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Who's that? Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. So again, there's this connection to the act of godliness when yes. it comes to material wealth in terms of giving away. The source of contentment is Jesus. Jesus yeah. That leads to sure. contentment, sufficiency, and motivates us to be generous with abundance that we may find ourselves. Not everyone will have an abundance. Sure. It's kind of like in this first Timothy, it's the desire to be rich. So speaking to those who are not rich, don't desire to be rich. Mm. And then as he goes to verse 17 and 19, but to those who find themselves to be rich, you too give away out of that abundance. Mm. They're speaking to those who desire to be rich and then those who are rich. The point is not whether you have much or whether you have little, but mm. it's to be content. Yes. The source is a person of Christ and should you have abundance, give it away. That's sure. a simple summary, I think. <laughs> <laughs> is it, uh, maybe just to go off a bit of a tangent, what makes it hard for us to be content? You know, just in our day and age, um, mm. you know, northern suburbs, you know, why, why, why is this such an elusive, an elusive thing? Because it's, it's, it's not an easy thing. Um, One simple answer, I think, it, most people probably have heard this phrase before, but um, comparison is mm. the thief of contentment. Sure. Isn't that how it goes? Something like yeah. that. But comparison is a thief of joy, I think people yeah. say. Uh, but comparison is, is does ruin contentment. So yeah. part of it is just comparing. You yeah. know, I mean, just imagine you on a desert island sure. and... Uh, you grew up and all you had was this this little hut and you, you know, your parents taught you to go fishing and you ate fish from the sea and, and you know, you, you looked in the mirror and all you saw was your own image there, you know. Would you ever be discontent with your physical appearance? Would you ever be discontent mm. with your material belongings if that's all you knew, mm. you know? It's like it's, largely yeah. discontentment comes through you're aware of another kind of life. Yeah. You're aware of people who have more, people who are more physically mm. attractive or yeah. et cetera, you know. Sure. So, yeah, if we had no sense of there being a different standard in life. So, comparison, I would say, is a quick yeah. one sure. of uh, ruins contentment, mm. ruins joy. But uh, sure. deep on a deeper sense, I think there is this materialistic desire yeah. that plunges people into destruction. And on mm. Sunday, it was quite hectic because mm. I said it's like, you know, the greatest enemy or one of the enemies to your spiritual faith is materialism. And that is. is what Paul says. Is. Like he is using the language of damnation. Yeah. He really is. Mm. And James 5 verse 7 says another thing, warning, something similar, warning to the rich. Mm. Like there really is a spiritual sense here. Yeah. You know, we can't ignore that. Yeah. That, I mean, even Adam and Eve in the garden, like this kind of temptation for something sort of material and yeah. uh, attached around the fruit. Yeah. Think about Esau selling his birthright for yeah. a bowl of stew. You know, this sure. kind of material circumstances mm. and this desire, these pangs. So yeah. Paul even used the words, pierced themselves with many pangs later. Mm. So it's like these, these cravings and these desires that just kind of overwhelm it and spiritually end up Esau sells his birthright, yeah. you know, for the for the bowl of stew. Sure. Like there's a spiritual mm. effect that um, comes out of these not being able to tame earthly desires. Sure. So, I mean, not to over-spiritualize, but we can't ignore that. Paul yeah, we can't, yeah. You know? yeah. And there are other cross-references. There's um, Proverbs that talk about it, Psalms. Uh, let's go there. Mm. Um, there's uh, Psalm 37, Psalms 37 verse 16. Um, I'll just turn there and read uh, from my reliable NIV. <laughs> NIV did good with Philippians 4. <clears throat> it's I'll, beautiful, I'll yeah. yeah. It's, it's a beautiful translation. Um, it says here, yeah, better the little that the righteous have than the wealth of many wicked. I think what's interesting about these cross-references that we'll read is, is it, it really is tracking back to this idea of simplicity. Mm. So, I mean, contentment, whether you have much, Paul speaks about that. Yeah. You're content with much, you're content with little. But First Timothy 6 verse 8, but if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Yeah. It's really speaking of this life of simplicity. And I think these cross-references mm. speak to that. Better is the little yeah. that the righteous has than the abundance of the, you know, of the wicked. Proverbs 15, 16, better mm. is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with, with it. it. Yeah. Proverbs 16, 8, better is a little with righteousness. Sure than great revenues with injustice. And I think sure. those cross-references tie in with 1 Timothy 6 verse 8. If we have food and clothing, we'll be content. The yeah. sort of little with godliness. Mm. 
Unless there's a little, you know, is is contentment. Sure. Rather, and it's a bit of a false paradox because it doesn't mean that if you have much, you can't also be righteous. If you yes. have much, you won't have fear of the Lord. But I think it just tracks here with the idea of simplicity, which mm. I wonder if as Christians today, if we took seriously mm. the the idea of living with simplicity. Yeah. Uh, so kind of not living uh, or keeping margin mm. in our lives when it comes to financial expenses so that we can be generous, yeah. so that we can you know help those in need. So yeah. it tracks back to the Rule of Life series yes. and uh, uh, the one sermon on that, on, on, on justice mm. and justice and helping the poor. Like it, yeah. it means people living within their means. Yeah. So that there is margin, yeah. and, and I wonder if we, and I say this, I say we really particularly because like it's just really difficult. Like, yeah. well, where is that boundary in your own life with yeah. what, what is simplicity, what is contentment, and what is abundance? I wonder if we really pursued that mm. simplicity. I was listening to uh, a podcast with uh, Kerry Newoff and Gordon McDonald talking about this subject. I okay, think just mainly from a pastoral point of view, just how pastors should view, you know, their finances. Um, you know, I, I was really convicted because it's, you know, you really think the people are looking and are watching, they're looking for an example uh, from us as pastors. And, mm -hmm. and I think if you think about our own context, how this pastoral office has often been used, you know, largely by the prosperity, health world, prosperity gospel preachers to to get themselves more money, um, all the more why we should be great stewards, mm. you know, of what God has given us. Um, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, so I was just really challenged yeah. by that. And again, it, it, it tracks back to the aspect of contentment, you know. Um, yeah, we're just never satisfied with what we have. You mm. always want one, one more thing, you know, mm. and I think you use the bike. One more bike. One more yeah. bike, you know, <laughs> uh, which I could relate to because I've, I've been complaining a little bit about my bike. Uh, <laughs> Yo, you see, you've only got the one, the mountain bikes. I've got to say, N plus one applies to you, man. You need, uh, you need at least two. Like, there's a bare minimum here. <laughs> Contentment in cycling, the, the, the bottom line is two. Yeah. And from then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it is that. Even if you just think of, uh, I mean, silly things with like cell phones, you know, yeah. like when new ones come out, it's always like. Um, I do. I'm a bit, you know, I have a bit of a gadget guy. So this is always like mm. upgrades yeah. to anything, to your life, to your house, to yeah. your stuff that I just feel like would make you happy. But, you know, you asked a question earlier about um, sources of discontentment. Yeah. And we spoke about comparison and we spoke about, honestly, the evil one. Um, mm -hmm. But I think another source of contentment, of discontentment, is an overemphasis on, on just what is earthly. So mm. I think it maybe tracks to what I want to get to talking about as well is Paul uses as motivation here, as motivation for contentment. He speaks a lot about eternity. Mm. Mm. So the, the eternal state and our eternal destiny is a huge motivating yeah. factor for a lot of Christianity. For example, I'll just give guys a heads up on this Sunday. But fight the good fight of the faith and the battles, like he's going to motivate people with, you know what, one day in eternity, there won't be suffering. Mm -hmm. There won't be a struggle against the evil one. There won't be a struggle against the flesh. There won't be a struggle against brokenness. You know, he's going to motivate mm -hmm. with, you know what, on that day, the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ will come again. And, you know, and I think we underestimate the, the motivation of eternity. Yeah. We become so just narrow, I mean, I don't know, focused on here and now yeah and and <clears throat> just forget that there's a the perspective of eternity changes, changes our earthly yeah. perspective and that's exactly what paul's doing here mm. he's trying to change their perspective yeah. and that's why he brings up um we brought nothing into this world exactly we'll take nothing out of it exactly why does he say that sure. he's trying to give perspective it's mm. like you know do you really think sure. that your material circumstance is what's of significance mm. because hey you bring it in you can't take it out and yeah. there's uh, cross references there I think that we could read about that just to sure. bring home this uh, yeah. motivating tool that Paul uses of eternity. So yeah. do you want to go read? Yeah, I'll read Job uh, one twenty one. 
It says, And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Psalm 49 verse 17, For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. Mm. His glory will not go down after him. Sure. Same idea in Ecclesiastes 5.15. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he can that he may carry away in his hand. So he's really, Mm. you know, this is a general biblical principle of the eternal perspective uh, that's that's trying to get us to not over fixate on Mm. material circumstances. So in this passage, does it a lot. So brings up the uh, sort of eternal view of life. So uh, in verse seven, so it says, we brought nothing into the world. We cannot take anything out. Verse 12, which comes up, you know, this week, so, you mm-hmm. know, fight the good fight of the faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then in verse 19, when he speaks about uh, the rich, as for the rich, he says that to be, uh, to do good, to be rich in good works, generous mm-hmm. and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves mm-hmm. as a good foundation for the future. And the future, as I said on Sunday, yeah. isn't your retirement, it's the age to come, <laughs> it's, it's the, the eternal come, yeah. age. So yeah. storing up for themselves. Mm. So he really, you can't miss. He's motivating people mm. with the sense of eternity, keeping yeah. eternity uh, in mind. And I think what that, I mean, just on a real grassroots level, the you brought nothing into the world and you can't take anything out. I think what that is supposed, like you reduce that to a simple sense. It's like, hey, money can't stop you dying. You know, like yeah. so focused on money, yeah. it can't stop you dying. You know, like it is. So there's that perspective, but I think mm. I read one helpful thing in a commentary here that was so good. It said, birth and death both illustrate the tenuous relation between life and material goods, mm. birth and death. So the reason he brings up birth and death, they illustrate the tenuous relationship between life and material goods. And he goes on to say this. I think this is Bob Yarbrough. It says, Paul wants to relativize not trivialize or eliminate the importance of earthly acquisitions, Mm. since he observes people tempted to enlist God in their material quest. How good is that? But he wants Mm. to relativize Mm. the importance of earthly acquisitions. That's what he's doing. Just not detach ourselves from anything to do with money. It's mm. dirty. It's horrible. You're going to go to hell if you even whiff money. Like, no, no, he's still... He goes on to speak to those who are rich. So yeah. it's not detach ourselves from anything to do. Yeah. Uh, so to not trivialize or eliminate, but relativize. Like yeah. bring it into perspective. That's exactly, yeah. You can't take that stuff with you, yeah. you know. And I, that's largely what he's doing here, I mm. think. And that principle, it's all, it's all over the Gospels, you know. It is. Uh, what, what benefit is it to gain the whole world? And yet forfeit your soul. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Um, yeah. So That's just, the teaching of Jesus. So yeah. this is a teaching, yeah. a godliness that is in accordance with yeah. the teaching that produces godliness. Is yes, yeah. that's what Jesus said. Is Luke mm. 12, 15. Yeah. Not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Yeah. Or I think the ESV says, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness, yes. i.e. greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance mm. of his possessions. Yeah. Sure. So yeah, a real Christian household code almost, like way we should live yeah. all through the Bible and yet yeah. so difficult to actually Sure. And those principles are there. That way. Uh, I mean, they're helping us. Um, sure. And you, 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 you spoke about, I can't pronounce it, stoicism. Yes. Stoicism. Yes. Which we are stoic, yeah. Stoicism. <laughs> yeah. Stoicism. I just say the Stoics. That's yeah, the Stoics. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> which was a philosophy that was, uh, you know, pushed as a way to get contentment, mm. but that failed, right? Uh, so basically, people had to repress, yeah, any... crush their desires, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Christ is. I think the the central thing is, Christ is our source of our contentment, you know, and we cannot fight for contentment apart from him. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want us to move into the, um, you know, the practical application. So living with simplicity, you know. Uh, yeah, I think let's go back there because yeah. I didn't get a chance to do that, but I, I feel like it is at the center and maybe just for mm-hmm. guys listening can go back to the rule of life yeah. sort of sermon and um, 
Yeah, I think there's something here. I remember my brother. So he's shout out to my brother. You know him actually. Yes, Nganyiso <laughs> Van Lissot. Yes, yeah. on Facebook, that's his yeah. name. Um, but uh, he, I remember in his sort of conversion story, I don't want to tell his story, but uh, he had this, I think it was a little sticker that he made and he stuck at his stuff, but um, that said, live simply so others can simply live. Sure. It's like this little motto, you know, yeah. and, um, sure. and I think he largely does live his life that way. And um, live simply so others can simply live, and it's kind of a mm. just a cute it's little a motto. But it's yeah. true. I yeah. think there's this simplicity that if we could live with simplicity, we'd have more to give, yeah. and to really make an impact in the kingdom. So yeah. Rolf yeah. Winter, you, you know the name Rolf Winter. So he's a big missiologist yes, guy. Wrote him, yeah. so many global missions yeah. textbooks, but he said obedience to the Great Commission has more consistently been poisoned by affluence than by anything else. Sure. It's those who love their money don't give it away. They don't. Yeah, and so hold, he, hold. really, he goes on to speak about this, you know, um, a materialistic world won't be reached by a materialistic uh, church because the resources needed will be kept in our second homes and our nicer possessions, he mm. says. And we continue to give our pennies to the Great Commission. Mm. So I think I, I did want to go there a little bit, challenge a little bit more. Yeah. I think learning to live with simplicity would enable mm. greater generosity, greater yeah. being rich in good works, mm. and really for the for the kingdom. And I think yeah. one of the shining examples here, I referenced it on Sunday, but I didn't give the whole story, is John Wesley. Yes. Do you know the story of John Wesley? Like when it came to his... His, how he approached his finances. Uh, no, I don't. I so, don't I mean, he's super famous for obviously being this great evangelist yes. and part of the Great Awakening or the, you know, the the revival in, yes. in the UK at the time. And Charles Wesley wrote all the hymns and the founder of Methodism, etc. Mm. So, I, yeah, I have Methodist background. So, like yes. John Wesley was just this huge guy. But this little known story is about his approach to finances. So, um I think he, the quote I had on Sunday was, make as much as you, you can, can, give as much as you can. Yeah. And so that wasn't just something he said. He lived by that. So the sure. story goes, and I think it's a true story, is in kind of his income wise. So year one, uh, he earned 30 pounds, it was. He decided he could live on 28. Mm. So that was over the year. And so he gave away two pounds. So you're like, well, that's not much. Uh, as he continued, he became more famous. And as all this, uh, you know, his ministry grew and the church grew and mm. his wealth grew, he continued this practice of basically decided he could live on 28 pounds. So oh. throughout his life, even when his income rose to apparently over 1,400 pounds per annum. So from oh. 30 to 1,400, so that's a massive growth in wealth. He gave away everything but 30 pounds. Sure. You just maintained the standard of living, mm. 28, 30 pounds. So it went from 28 to 30, let's call that inflation. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of the 1,400 he gave away. So it was sure. really the sense of, you know, we con if our food and clothing will be content. And the yeah. story goes that at the end of his life, all he had left was his coat and a few pennies in his coat pocket. Sure. Because he'd literally sort of given it all away. Yeah. And I mean, that's maybe not something that's prescriptive, but I think it highlights. So he's the one who said, make as much as you can, yeah, give away as much as you can. can. He yeah. lived by that. The point yeah. is not to make as little as you can. Yeah. That's not Christianity. You know, to some, God absolutely gives the ability yeah. to create wealth, to create employment. And we mm. just look at these figures in the Bible of Abraham. I mean, yeah. the wealthiest men who lived. Job. Yeah. I mean, we reference Job who was really wealthy. Yeah. Then he went through all those trials. Remember, everything got sure. taken away. And then what happened at the end? Sure. So he was the wealthiest man who lived. Mm. And then at the end of his life, God restored to him, yeah. gave him double. So he was sure. double the wealthiest man. <laughs> but righteous to his core. Yeah. You know, we have all these examples. Yes. Uh, the point is not, you know, uh, <clears throat> money is poison, etc. Mm. It's mm. to detach ourselves from uh, just the discontentment. Yeah find that contentment in Christ mm. and be able to, if we have abundance, whatever that abundance mm. is, to give it away and yeah. live with simplicity. Sure. Um, That's helpful, Rich. Um, I've got one more quote if you're going to move on yeah. <laughs> from that simplicity. Yeah, sure. Uh, from the sure. Lausanne Committee for World Evangelization about mm. 30 years ago. So Lausanne yes. is this yes. kind of interdenominational evangelical I know Chris gathering Oliovi of people. Is a part of that. Uh, ah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So a big thing trying to unite Christians yeah. in terms of, across the world to yeah. be on mission. So the Van the Luzan Committee for World Evangelization over 30 years ago made this kind of one resolution. 
which is quite challenging, so can I read it mm. around simplicity? Sure. It says, yet you resolve to renounce waste and oppose extravagance in personal living, clothing and housing, mm. travel and church buildings. Mm. We also accept the distinction between necessities and luxuries, creative hobbies and empty status symbols, mm. modesty and vanity, occasional celebrations and normal routine, and between the service of God and slavery to fashion. Where to draw the line requires conscientious thought and decision by us together with members of our family. Mm. So it's quite a strong like resolution to resolve mm. to do that, to be able to draw these lines. Yeah. Uh, it, that really does take a lot of conscious thought yeah. and decision which was the whole rule of life emphasis sure. to try and just determine it. I don't know if guys remember from that, but I came across that one little paradigm long time ago with, with that sense of look at your budget, mm. track your expenses over a month, I remember that, yeah. and look at what is sort of necessary, grocery stuff, and then, and then what is luxury. Yeah. So I used the example of the lemon creams, you know, which for me is a necessity. <laughs> <laughs> you know, coffee is a necessity. <laughs> but then there's, then there's the luxury items, you know, that yeah. you don't need. And just the principle in the rule of life was to at least give away mm. an equivalent amount of your luxury spend Mm. you know to specifically to poverty relief sure. was a rule of life challenge yeah. and, and I mean that's just I remember a that. kind I remember of that. Yeah. random sort of rule but it's this conscientious thought and mm. decision there's got to be some decision point yeah. around this else we just never live that way mm. and maybe it even is in, in your house maybe you, you mm. have a house that's a little more than what you need and you mm. would work out what, what the uh, necessity portion of your house was and what the abundance portion of your house was will then give an equivalent away yeah. it's just a a way like yeah. John Wesley did it different and I think in that sermon we spoke a lot about I'm just really going way back to the beginning yeah. of the year about it's not the percentage amount that you, mm. that you give like some are able to give more etc but yeah. it's this it's just this principle of contentment absolutely yeah with what we have and coupled with generosity. And that's where Paul tracks in First yeah. Timothy chapter 6. He moves from the desire to be rich for its own sake through to those who have mm. and been able to give away. So, Sure. So what, what would you say <clears throat> would be an application from this? You know, I, I'm, drawing, I'm drawing some applications for myself. I'll share one. Mm. I'll just say, one, I just need to have a strong conviction around this. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I need to sit down and figure out within our how my household, you know, what are some convictions that we need to put in place, you know. Um, so that's one takeaway for me. Um, just convictions around money, how we use it, how we spend, how we give, how much we give away. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I just think that's a helpful thing for me. But just what would you say is a, is a helpful application, you know. Yeah, I think it would come down to a, a bit of a discussion with your spouse or, mm. or just your own in your own sort of mind is like, am I discontented? Sure. In other words, what am I dreaming about mm. buying or getting? Or, you know, am I discontented? And is that um, is that discontentment rooted in just an unhealthy attachment? Mm. Or is it based on really I actually need to, you know, if you, like you don't have a job, mm. you know? And, and so, I mean, you just, like, we, we want to say, yeah, the desire to go and get a job and to earn, like, that's a good thing and to be praying, you know, over that. So it's, it's to analyze where the discontentment is coming from. Is it from a valid place of, sure. I actually need to pursue something here? Or, mm. or is it out of a sense, really, it's just the discontentment is yeah. just so materialistic. And I yeah. think that initial, you know, thought and discernment is quite it's easy. Helpful. I think there are literally things that mm. I can think about. So, I mean, I'll just give a quick example. So, I mean, it was my birthday recently mm. and uh, a big 4-1. <laughs> big 4-1. <four laughs> Why are you giving away my age, man? <laughs> I'm still trying to pretend I'm 25. <laughs> and so, you know, I got a little bit of money like like uh, from from two friends and so, so where did I go to is why? <laughs> Cycle there. Cycle there. Well, obviously. Well, one of them was a voucher so I had to go there but it's from a friend who knows me Good enough to know, man. Just give the OK cycle lab yeah. voucher. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my wife, actually. And specifically, she said, this is to upgrade your ride. Sure. So, OK, so now I'm going to go, you know, and and like there's just 
couple of things I'm like, man, okay, I want a new saddle mm. because my other saddle doesn't match my bike. And <laughs> stuff's got to match or you're slow. I don't know if you know that rule, but like a new saddle. <laughs> like uh, I really want like a new pair of cycling shoes, mm. you know, and uh, what was the other thing on my list was that. And there was one other thing, like a new helmet because, again, I'm just tired of my old one, you know. But I really only had enough for one. <laughs> so I'm going to cycle. I'm like, you know what? I was going to do it. I'm going to get all three. This is a true story, man. <laughs> and I'm like, I'd gone on the website and I'd like, here's the helmet, here's the shoes, here's the set.